Hepburn, who is uh, a very good friend to the library. In any case, Bob uh, has worked for the Toronto Star for many years. He's been bureau chief in Ottawa, Washington, and the Middle East. He has reported for more than 30 countries uh, and has also served as the Star's editorial page editor, assistant managing editor, national editor, and foreign editor. We're very happy to have him here tonight. Please welcome Bob Hepburn. Toronto Star has been for decades a proud partner with the Toronto Public Library. And we've been doing these Star Talks events here for seven or eight years. This is the first one of 2017. In the past, we've had everywhere from Margaret Trudeau to astronauts to tonight's event. And my role is to introduce Ed Keenan. He's one of our city columnists. He is our city columnist. And he'll introduce Jennifer Keysmat and Ian Gillespie. Here's what Ian says about himself in his bio on our website. Edward Keenan has lived in Toronto all his life and has made its people, politics, and culture the subject of his writing for more than a decade at various publications, some of which I'm not going to mention. His book, Some Great Idea, Good Neighborhoods, Crazy Politics, and the Invention of Toronto explores Toronto's history and identity crisis in the years since amalgamation. There's a lot more to add than that. <laughs> he may know this city as well as anyone. Here's why. He's lived in Riverdale, Scarborough, Danforth, and Coxwell in the Annex, Harbour Village, Lure Court Village, the junction. He's worked for small business owners from the India, the United States, Sri Lanka, Korea, China, the Caribbean, England, and Russia. He's worked at a chemical factory in an, in an industrial park and at a day camp in a low-income housing development. He's cut grass at a military base and at roadsides in North York and Etobicoke. He's been a shoe salesman, a candy counter attendant, a telemarketer and a courier in the financial district. He's owned a restaurant on Young Street, lost his shirt, <laughs> and been a carnival barker at the CNE. And then he turned to writing. And what a career he's had since then. He's been nominated eight times for a National Magazine Awards. And at the Star, we're thrilled that he works with us. One of the reasons is his passion for Toronto. Here's how he describes that passion. I love the city. Everything I would want in a city is here. Please welcome Ed Keenan. Thanks so much for that great introduction, Bob. Uh, Whew. Uh, Jennifer didn't know I used to run a restaurant. It was actually directly across the street from here at 828 Young Street. And fittingly enough, I see uh, as I come, uh, there's a residential development application in place to level the building where it stood and build over 500 units of new housing, uh, perhaps to tackle the affordability crisis. Uh, thank you all for coming here tonight. Uh, I know that this is... Uh, by far the biggest news item happening today in the world, probably. <laughs> I can't think of anything else. There's this thing in Washington, I guess. Uh, and in Ottawa, uh, the big city mayors are gathered to discuss housing affordability. I just saw the mayor of our city uh, sent out a message saying that they're putting in a request for more social housing assistance. Um, so they, in Ottawa, will be relieved when we tell them that we have solved the problem here tonight. Uh, and no doubt we will. We have a great, uh, a, a couple great people here to talk it through for us. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I'll introduce them up. Jennifer Keysmat, uh, whose picture is on the posters, we know fairly well in this city. She is the chief planner and executive director of city planning for the city of Toronto and was a founding partner of the Office for Urbanism, a planning and design and cons planning and design firm that specializes in the integration of planning, design, and consensus building processes. She is an award-winning member of the Canadian Institute of Urban Planners and a member of the Congress for New Urbanism. She was a principal of Dialogue. 
She's a regular guest lecturer at York University, the University of Toronto and Ryerson, where she speaks on diverse subjects that include policy development, urban development processes, and implementation strategies. Uh, she studied at the University of Western Ontario and York University in Toronto. Uh, Jennifer Kiesma. Right. Uh, Ian Gillespie is a Canadian real estate developer. <clears throat> Uh, in 1992, he founded West Bank Projects Corporation based in Vancouver, British Columbia, which now has more than $12 billion of projects completed or under development. Perhaps he's best known in Toronto uh, recently uh, for his plan to redevelop the Honest Ed site in the annex. Uh, the company, West Bank, is active across Canada and expanding into the United States with luxury residential, rental apartments, affordable housing, offices, retail, and hotels. He completed a business degree at UBC and then an MBA at the University of Toronto, after which he began his career when he joined shopping center developer Schroeder Properties in Vancouver, Ian Gillespie. Come on up. Uh, I just wanted to uh, talk, bring to our attention as a way to kick off this discussion a few news items uh, that I noticed over the past week alone. Uh, so the price of a house on Markham Street uh, <laughs> A particular house, a semi-detached house, went up 60% uh, in two years. It was sold uh, two years ago, and it, it was sold again this, this just last month, and the price went up 60% to, I think it was $1.2 million. Uh, there's another news item in the Globe and Mail about bidding wars for rental condos, I mean the prices of rental condos in Toronto are skyrocketing. Average downtown monthly rent in to, to Toronto core is now $2,100. Um, Meanwhile, Toronto Community Housing, our subsidized housing agency, is slated to close 425 units due to disrepair this year, and it's on track to board up one unit a day in 2018. Uh, meanwhile, 177,000 people are on the waiting list for subsidized affordable housing. Uh, at one end of the market, my colleague Tess Kalinowski in the Star reported just uh, earlier, just this week, that uh, almost the, the the number of houses sold, selling for over $4 million last year in Toronto doubled. Uh, and uh, in, on this weekend, one of my colleagues will report uh, that, that our homeless shelters, despite us investing $2 million, new, $2 million in last year's budget in homeless shelters, are operating over 95% capacity so far this year, uh, which means that, that in, in practice, that often they're over full and people uh, have no place to sleep. So all of that adds up to me. That means that from the very bottom of the, the housing market, uh, whether we're talking rentals or, or subsidized affordable spaces, to the very top, the luxury end of the market, um, things have become increasingly, distressingly unaffordable um, for the middle class, for the poor, even for upper middle class professionals. The type of housing that they would expect to live in uh, is now increasingly out of their price range. So I guess two, two questions to kick it off, and I'll just throw them out to both of you, is, is sort of what causes this? And what can cities do about it? Jennifer? So I'll begin uh, just with a few comments. Maybe we'll go back and forth on this one because we could probably spend the whole evening talking about what causes this. Part of this is about Toronto coming as a, of age as a global city. We, in fact, are recognized on a world stage and are drawing investment on a world stage. So whereas in the past we had much more of a local economy, we saw a lot of interprovincial immigration, we see a significant amount of international immigration, we see capital coming from around the world, and that is fundamentally transforming our housing market. It's also transforming other markets, such as our office market. One of the challenges with what cities can do lies in the fact that we are in many ways responding to something that wasn't anticipated and that we don't really control. So for example, after 9-11, Toronto saw a significant amount of international capital coming into the city. That was as a result of the perception of instability south of the border that made Toronto a much more attractive place for landing capital. Uh, if we take that one step farther with what's happening with a Trump presidency, 
I spoke to a developer this week who told me that he has been extremely active in Chicago talking to large multinational corporations that are looking for a safe place to expand. And in their mind, it's not Chicago. Uh, and that's, you know, if you've heard about some of the criminal issues, the shootings in Chicago, then you combine that with the broader instability that's taking place nationally, the decline in population that's taking place in Chicago, as opposed to our increase in population, the fact that we're attracting people, all of these create a series of critical success factors that are in fact making us incredibly desirable on an international scale, and I would say the same for Vancouver, incredibly desirable on an international scale. The risk is you have a significant amount of capital coming in from elsewhere that in fact is overwhelming what we perceive to be what used to be a local market, what you used to be able to buy in terms of a house is now shifting under the weight of all of this global interest in our, in our city. There's another piece of it that's really important and must be stated as well. As difficult as this is, and it demands a tremendous amount of effort, creativity, policy, all levels of government coming into the table in order to address, address the issues that we see today, and I like the fact that you pointed out it's at all levels of affordability, as difficult as all of that is, and the fact that we all need to get our shoulder to the wheel to ensure that we're providing housing for everyone in this city, it's also a signal of our success. We are creating a highly desirable place to live. In 2015, we were ranked by the World Index on Youthful Cities as the most desirable city in the world for young people. New York City was second, Berlin was third, Toronto was number one in that ranking. That enhances the desirability of Toronto as a place to live and work. And when you take us out of our Canadian context and even our North American context, and you begin comparing us to cities like New York and Berlin and London and Paris, we actually suddenly seem really affordable in comparison to those cities. So I would argue that our whole frame of reference has shifted from being maybe regional, maybe national, to becoming international. And that comes, alongside of that comes a whole new set of challenges in terms of how we as a city uh, address it. And I can speak to that part, but yeah. I'll let Ian no, talk about it. No, bit there's, first. A, there's a whole uh, a set of things, traffic congestion uh, and housing affordability among them that are sort of like the good problems to have because the cities that don't have those problems are, are sort of hollowed out and shrinking and often tend to have high unemployment. And hey, Detroit is taking, taking down 40,000 <laughs> houses. No, exactly. Detroit has no ca uh, traffic congestion, right? But, but I mean, there, there is a. a I, I'm looking for an expression, but good problems to have are good problems to have, but but they still feel like problems if you can't afford a, a roof over your head. So, exactly. I mean, we still try to figure out how to mitigate those things. But from your perspective as a developer and as somebody who's mm -hmm. active in the markets, um, what do you think are the key elements of the problem to the extent that it's a problem well, um, and, how, and addressing it? Yeah, maybe uh, just to echo a couple of the points that Jennifer made. I mean, to, to give you some perspective, I, I, I think in 2015-16, Vancouver and Toronto created 175,000 jobs, and the rest of Canada shed 50,000 jobs. Um, Canada, or Toronto and Vancouver now contribute 30% of Canada's GNP. In 2050, that's going to be close to 50%. So, you know, uh, you're ending up in a situation where you know, when people talk about housing affordability, it really is a conversation about Vancouver and Toronto. Um, I don't know that they're really having this conversation as active in other, in other communities. Um, I think the other thing that, that people need to be careful of is, is, is the, the statistics can sometimes, um, uh, I think, make things a little confusing. You know, if you took out, uh, uh, let's put single-family homes apart for a second, and we'll come back to single-family homes because I think that's a different story altogether, mm -hmm. and concentrate just on multi-residential. If you take off the top 20% of the market, okay, okay. and just look at 80% of the market, housing affordability in Toronto today, considering where interest rates are, is actually historically 
at around where it has always been. So, and I just want to clarify yeah. that because I had seen a chart uh, maybe a year or two ago that showed uh, your monthly payment adjusted for inflation right. at today's interest rates is lower than it was in the early 1980s because uh, some of you may remember that in the early 1980s your mortgage was like a credit card interest right. rate, right? 25%. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, the down payment becomes right. huge for first-time buyers, right. right? But that's right. what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I'm just saying that the the, the, the numbers get skewed, um, mm -hmm. and and a part part of that, of course, is the issues around income uh, inequality, which is you know a whole other um, yeah. debate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so we have a we have an income inequality issue. Um, there's no doubt, and um, um, and I think that's part of it. But I think there's also there's this history that we've had in in you know since since uh, World, War, World War II, for sure, of, of, the, of the traditional single-family home. And people have built up this expectation that they have, uh, their, their grandparents had one, and their parents had one, and that they should have one. And it's almost like it, it's become almost a right that they should own a single-family home. And, um, you know, I think we have to start questioning those things. I, um, I'm, I grew up in a 700-square-foot house with a wood-burning stove, um, that my parents still live in, and 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 now if someone said to you, okay, you're going to have in that case five kids, you're going to live in a 700 square foot house. Suddenly you have a housing problem, <laughs> and I don't feel like I'm any worse off uh, for living in a small home. But nowadays, now you have to live in a 5,000 square foot house, and and uh, everything. I think part of this is expectations. It feels like there was a leap at some point because my father uh, grew up in Toronto in, in Riverdale on Victor Avenue, if anybody knows that neighborhood, in a, a three-bedroom house. Uh, but he had eight sisters, so his parents had one bedroom, mm -hmm. he had one bedroom, and his eight sisters right. slept on two beds in the other bedroom, right? right. And, and this was considered really typical. Right. Uh, they, didn't even, they, they thought it was so typical that actually my mom and his sister were roommates. She had a big double bed and, and invited, so they lived together in a one-room apartment when they first moved out. And I said, did people think things? And she said, <laughs> they didn't think that at the time. Uh, but, uh, but now it seems so comical, right? Yeah. Um, at some point, we got this idea that everybody should have a house. Um, is part of adjusting to this people actually adjusting their expectations that in places like New York, uh, many families live their whole lives in an apartment. In Montreal, there's a long tradition of, mm -hmm. of whole generations living in rental apartments. That's right. Do we need to move in that direction in Toronto? Is that part of it? Well, this is a very interesting question, and uh, I'll tell a very personal story, and it has to do with the Toronto Star uh, reporter, um, because I was asked about this question of affordability and how are millennials ever going to afford a home, the assumption being a single-family mm -hmm. home, and I told the story, uh, I was on uh, Metro Morning, and I talked about, well, it's important to be creative. And I talked about, you know, we, we're starting to hear stories of people who are sharing a house, mortgage sharing, uh, you know, renting out, owning a house and renting out a portion of the house, which you, which you can do uh, in Toronto. And I was actually vilified by a reporter who um, criticized me because I live in a single family home. And I called up the reporter and I said, you know, it wasn't, me. It wasn't Ed, uh, it wasn't Ed, but um, I called her up and I said, uh, can I just tell you my story here for a minute? Because I came to the city of Toronto and I actually lived in a basement apartment for four years with my husband so that we could save for a down payment. Then we bought our first house in Ronsonsville and when we bought it, we rented out the main floor and we rented out the basement and we lived in the top two, two floors. And we didn't feel hard done by, and I think it was less than square, 700 square, it was a small amount of space, but we were thrilled to be, in, uh, to be living in a neighborhood in a big city, um, and we didn't feel any skin off our nose as far as we were concerned. This was, this was our way into the market, and these were sacrifices that we had to make. And I have to tell you, living in a basement apartment for four years is no, uh, it's no whining and dining, right? It's not, it's, it's, it can be pretty tough, it's pretty dark down there. But we were willing to do that as a way of trying to get a foot in the door. And it was funny because this reporter was very young. I said to her, so where do you live? And you know, she lives in a condo on the 26th floor, uh, a condo with amenities, and she's quite young. And I said, wow, those are the years I was living in the basement apartment. And she was <laughs> criticizing me uh, for suggesting that, you know, you need to be a little bit creative to get into the market. So that was 20 years ago. But if we look back 20 years again, 
One of our tenants who lived on the main floor was a good friend of mine who had grown up in that neighborhood. And when she was growing up, she lived in a house in that neighborhood with her mom and dad, her grandma and grandpa, and an aunt and uncle. And they all had one floor of the house. And you know what? They didn't feel hard done by. They were very happy to live in the city close, close to their jobs. And now, you know, she's the next generation. She was renting for us, and she eventually got her own home. But I think part of this is about, I think, the fallacy of the American dream, that you hit 25 years old and you get this big expansive home and with a granite countertop. And I just think it's actually never been that way. It wasn't that way 20 years ago. It wasn't that way 20 years before. And so somehow this is about a readjustment. You know what? Buying a house in a big city, it's really tough. It's actually a hard, it's a hard thing to do. It's a good thing to do if you can get into the market, but it's always been a difficult thing to do. Try okay. to buy a single family house in New York. Was it? No, yeah, well that's, I mean, that's long been the example, right? And I, but I think a lot of people, I, I mean, I think there's a push-pull. A lot of people think, hope that Toronto and Vancouver don't become a place where a, a place like Manhattan, the, the downtown, the core of the city is basically for the super rich or those who live in subsidized housing. Mm -hmm. and, and increasingly the middle class lives in a further flung out I, areas. I, I, I don't think any Canadians want that either. I mean, I think that, that, that Canada shares different values. And I, and I think that, um, I think that there's a, a, a lot of commonality but, um, in what we're all trying to do. And I think that, that Jennifer is taking a lot of leadership in that in Toronto. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the price of housing is no different than the price of anything else. It's supply and demand. And, uh, you know, currently what's, what's, what's going on is, is you have different governments talking about trying to curb demand. Um, CMHC has actually been doing a really good job of it um, uh, for the last year and a half or so. You know, they, they're cha you know, changing the requirements for first-time buyers, they're changing the requirements for foreign buyers, they're changing the requirements on the lenders, on the insurers, and they're trying to uh, take a little bit of the, uh, the steam out of the market. Mm -hmm. um, what's good about CMHC doing that is they're doing that on a national basis rather than on a city-by-city -city basis. When you start doing it on a city-by-city -city basis, you have to be careful of the ramifications of that. Um, the other conversations around demand management, like going on in Vancouver with the, f the foreign purchasers tax and, and things right, like that. Right, that was going to be actually my next yeah, question. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, uh, so we'll, we'll park that to well, the side. Okay. If you wanna, or, um, but I, I think that the issues around demand management are so difficult to manage and so difficult, especially for cities to manage. Um, Jennifer can't manage um, income growth in China or immigration patterns from India, or uh, Trump being elected to the United States, or interest rates going up and down, right. which is the biggest and, driver and maybe, of demand. Maybe three of right? those out of four, uh, I would hope Jennifer wouldn't even want to, <laughs> right? uh, even if she could. Right? Uh, but, 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 but so demand is really difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. Politicians love doing it because they need to be seen as doing something. Okay, so, so this is, in the example of Vancouver, and I have in the last, I don't, I don't necessarily even write about affordable housing all that often, but as a city columnist, I get a lot of unsolicited opinions, and I appear <laughs> on radio panels quite a bit. And, and so I get a lot of emails suggesting two things that Vancouver or BC has recently done that we should do here in Toronto, they say. Uh, and I hear them sometimes even at City Hall from, right. from uh, the Council Peanut Gallery. And one is uh, attacks on foreign buyers, uh, because there's an idea that, that a lot of Foreign wealth is parked here in vacant uh, condo units mm -hmm. or uh, real estate, which may be true. I don't know. Um, so a tax on foreign buyers, which uh, chokes off demand somewhat in a way that actually, I mean, many measures that would choke off demand, like an increase in interest rates or an increase in down payment uh, requirements, the way you're, you're restricting demand is by making it less affordable for many people to enter the market. You're saying you cannot afford to buy mm -hmm. a house. Voila! There's no demand for anybody mm -hmm. to buy a house. Mm -hmm. uh, foreign buyers maybe doesn't have that same effect. So that's one. The other is actually, strangely, by increasing demand, uh, the other initiative in, in BC is, is a, a loan for first-time home buyers of right. up to $37,500 uh, towards their down payment, mm -hmm. uh, which would tend 
maybe to drive prices up. Uh, but, but so those are two things that I hear a lot as suggestions for what we should do in Toronto, and I would love to hear both of your thoughts on both of those things. Let, let me go first because it's in Vancouver. There's, hopefully there's no reporters here. Um, <laughs> so uh, it was this big of headlines every day in the, the local papers in Vancouver. Uh, price affordable housing is as much as, a, is, as it is an issue in Toronto it pales in comparison to Vancouver and we have to keep in mind that incomes are lower in Vancouver than they are in Toronto and the price of housing is between 50 and 60 percent higher okay mm. so um, in that context housing affordability has become a bigger issue in Vancouver than it is in Toronto so it was getting to the point where the provincial government felt that they needed to do something with a provincial election coming in May of, uh, of this year. And so they decided over the course of a weekend um, to put the foreign purchasers tax in place and um, completely botched it um, in the course of doing that. I mean, it was such an un-Canadian uh, piece of legislation. Um, in fact, they told people who had bought their home sometimes two, three, four years ago that surprise, surprise, you didn't pay $500,000 for your house, we're just gonna stick you with a bill for another $75,000. Without that purchaser knowing. The purchaser shows up for closing and they said, oh, here's another $75,000 bill. And guess what, the banks won't finance it either. It was, it was, it was so shocking that the legal, the legal uh, environment in Vancouver was that you know, this is probably uh, against the law. Um, there's a number of, uh, of cases now uh, moving forward on it. But, a lot, but here's the good news for the provincial government. It was the uh, most popular piece of legislation in British Columbia history. 90% of people <clears throat> thought it was a great thing. And uh, so they just assured themselves that they'll win the next provincial election with that legislation. Um, and, it, uh, and so what was the effect of it? It's probably too early to tell, um, but in Vancouver, the statistics are a little bit uh, less developed than they are in, in, in Toronto, but we're probably around 5% of our market are, are foreign our purchasers. Foreign purchasers. Um, but in certain areas of the city, like the west side of Vancouver, it was probably 50%. Mm -hmm. In other areas of the city, it was like less than 1%. So it's very varied. So the single family market on the west side of Vancouver fell off a cliff. Like, housing sales went down by over 50%. Mm. I mean, just boom. Um, condominium market. Uh, I, I have one project that uh, came out uh, right around the time the tax was. We were expecting to sell it for, I'll just call it $100 a square foot. We ended up selling it for 150 Okay. Okay. So it didn't, it didn't hurt that, that part of the market at all. Um, and, and it's because the market really wasn't being driven uh, by that foreign buyer. Well, this is, and it's, this is interesting because in Toronto, to the extent that I hear people speculating that foreign buyers are driving mm -hmm. uh, prices, the, the suspicion is always that they're driving them in condo land, right? Down in City Place or yeah. across Harbor Front. Um, Jennifer, do we have any reliable information in the city about how big uh, a factor foreign buyers are in the market? We don't actually have the data to break it down in terms of condos and single family homes. We don't know that. What we do know from the analysis undertaken by CMHC is that unlike Vancouver where it's about, my understanding is it's 5.6% of the market, in Toronto approximately 3.8% of the market is foreign, foreign buyers. Now it raises the question, 3.8% of the market, is that transforming the market to Ian's point? Is that pretty localized? Like is that in two buildings in, mm -hmm. in Scarborough or is that more broadly spread uh, well, across the, the city? And the question, and, you know, the, the question I think you have to ask is um, preoccupying ourselves with a foreign buyer tax, is that really getting at the crux of the issue of housing affordability? And I would argue that it, that it isn't. It's a much more complex issue that we face in the city. Even if you saw, and we don't know, it's an experiment what's being done, and some ramifications. Imagine those mm -hmm. uh, single family homeowners where the market just dropped off by 40%. Anyone who just bought recently is 
I don't, now has a mortgage that's right. underwater. Sig- underwater. That's yeah. underwater. Yeah. Uh, so this is something you have to be careful with. For most people in their lifetime, um, their mortgage, their house is their their biggest asset. Mm-hmm. So when you start playing around with that, you can start getting people into some pretty tricky situations. I know a lot of young people who bought in, bought in the past couple of years. Uh, they're pretty nervous about any kind of government gesture that might somehow put them underwater, and they're going to have to spend the next 20 years uh, trying to dig themselves out of a hole. So I think government policy on this is something that has to be treated with a tremendous amount of sensitivity. I think what this gets to is the... uh, it, It adds clarity to the fact that the free market is not a good way of providing housing. It's not a good way of providing housing for everyone. And I think unless we confront that, as long as housing is treated as a commodity, as opposed to uh, uh, a right, something that everyone is required a home, and then we can get into the, you know, are, are back you? To, to the semantics of the other part of our conversation. Well, how big of a home? That's a, you know, that's kind of gibberish to get into that. But everyone should be entitled to a home with running water and electricity. And this is actually, it, it may sound a bit of a silly thing to say in Toronto, but if you've been through some of our Toronto community housing units, many of which are being shuttered, <coughs> this is a very serious issue in our city that not everyone has decent housing in the city, and we have long wait lists for families with well, children and, and who shock, can't afford housing. Well, and shock many of us that, that you would need to specify with running water and working heat and, and electricity and whatnot. Because, but I mean, so... But, the, so point, but say, the point being, I think yeah. the point being is that uh, we can talk about the foreign buyer issue, which is really about one small segment of the market and one small segment of our affordability issue, then there's a much bigger, bigger spectrum of housing affordability issues that we need to address. How do we create programs that enable teachers and nurses and uh, people in the service industry to live in the city of Toronto? And there's, there's actually lots of great international best practices and precedents. New York City actually has been a leader in this. Uh, historically, in the 60s and 70s, New York City, the universities created housing for professors and for teachers. And one of our big issues in Toronto, we have the largest cluster of university students in the province. Significant rental affordability issue is actually related to students. Well, that is directly related to the fact that universities have gotten out of housing students. University said, you know what, we don't want to be bothered with housing students. Those students are now in the market, actually competing for market housing while they're students. This is actually a problem. I actually think we need to be going back to hospitals, back to universities, and actually partnering with them to be providing affordable housing for nurses, for people who work in hospitals. In places where they can walk towards their In places work. where yeah. they can walk to work, where there's proximity. But these institutions actually need to re-engage in housing, not unlike they did back in the 60s and the 70s, as opposed to assuming that the market is going to provide for that housing because that's not happening and it's not going to happen. Okay, well, that, that, I mean, that is actually an interesting idea and, and one that I haven't heard much about. Um, working with institutions to encourage them or force them or, or partner with them to uh, build housing for their staff, for their students, for their whatnot. Um, I, I have heard quite a bit more that we need to invest in social housing, and it seems to me like that's a, a fairly straightforward matter of political will. Um, but then, then the other part of the market uh, is, is uh, you know, middle-income people, upper-income people across the spectrum. Uh, and rental housing and purchase housing. Uh, we haven't talked about the supply side as much. Yeah. And that was my next question, is that in addition to constantly hearing from people about the foreign buyer tax or the, 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 the demand side solutions, I also hear quite a lot, uh, especially from, from self-described libertarians. Uh, mm-hmm. And I know, Jennifer, you love answering this, so maybe I'll ask Ian first and then you can... No, I um, think I should take a stab at this um, first. <laughs> um, the, the two things I hear, and they're basically the same thing, is that one, if the city would just uh, throw open the, the floodgates and didn't require so much paperwork and zoning approvals and all of that stuff, uh, then, then people could, developer could build, baby build, and then we would have. Uh, now, a lot of people in this room, I'm sure, are under the impression we're already doing that uh, because we've grown very tall. 
Uh, but still, I hear from people that if, if it wasn't so difficult to, uh, to build, more people would build, and then, then uh, the supply would rise to meet the demand, prices would come down. And then linked to that is also uh, that if we just didn't have this silly environmental greenbelt legislation, then sprawl would take care of the problem, right? People will go and buy houses in <laughs> northern Ontario and commute by high-speed train, <laughs> and we'd be all right. So, so but, but those are two things, and I maybe exaggerate the extent, but the idea is that maybe the city should be doing more to allow and or encourage the, the fast construction of a lot more housing. So two, I will kick this one off and then I'll pass okay. it in. But because there's two, um, two ways that the record needs to be set straight. This is very important. I'm, I'm praying that we're not post-truth or post-facts here anymore. That <laughs> Post-science. That post-science. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the data still matters now that Trump is president. Um, and the first is this. We approve 20% more units on an annual basis than the industry can build. You have to think about that for a minute. We are not holding up the development process. Uh, and Ian can talk about this in more detail. What does it take to build a building? Well, you need financing. You need labor. You need development partners. You, if you're doing a tall building, you need a crane. There's not an unlimited number of cranes. So we are actually, we are approving more units than the industry can actually build in this city today. So that's the first point. It's a very important one. The second point is that in 2015, we built a record number of units in this city. We are building more units than any other city in North America on the supply side. So what's happening here, this goes back to the beginning of my comments, we're really popular. We're way more popular than we imagined we would be. It's demand. The demand is just astronomical. But we're, we're putting more supply into the market and that supply is occupied and absorbed, so units aren't sitting on the market empty, unsold. In the, the units that went onto the market in 2015 are 98% absorbed. That's astronomical by any measure in this industry. So those units aren't sitting there and no, and no one's buying them. That's because the demand is so high. We have a growth plan that establishes at the provincial level our growth targets. So this growth plan takes us to 2041. We have in 14 years of that, that time period, we've actually built 79% of the supply that we were expected to build over a 40-year period. Just let that sink in for a minute. We are growing very, very quickly as a city. And I would argue, you know, we've got 20% more approved than, we can than the industry can actually build right now. We have a very big risk in front of us right now, and that is around infrastructure. Because if you don't have the schools, and you don't have the parks, and you don't have the transit, you are actually ripping people off when you build housing because you are compromising their quality of life in other ways. Well, and, and so and we've got to make sure these two the things term. stay linked. So but from, from what I hear is that the city, the, the city is approving units faster than they can be built by the industry. Exactly. So this saying. argument that and, there's too and much that, restriction, then beyond that, it's not true. They're being bought as fast as they can be built because 98% absorption is a, is a sellout, right? Mm -hmm. right? Very high demand. Um, so then from as a developer's point of view, first of all, does that, does that check out? Does that sound right to you? And, and what are your further thoughts on that? Because then, then it feels like on, that demand, on the supply side, we're, we're backing into a circle then. If what we're talking about is how to make things more affordable by increasing the supply. If, if the supply is already, the throttle's already wide open, uh, then I don't know where you go from there. I think one, one thing that we all like to do is we try to simplify everything in order to get things um, more manageable. You know, it, Vancouver, uh, I think it's interesting to compare cities. Um, it would take me on average probably three times longer to get a project approved in Vancouver as it would in Toronto. Could someone please make note of that? <laughs> Is there a reporter in the oh, room? Oh, suddenly they all hope there's a reporter in the room. <laughs> reporter, reporter, where are you? Um, yeah, Vancouver is becoming probably the second most difficult jurisdiction in North America after San Francisco to get, to get a project approved. I mean, I did a 100% rental project in the West End uh, in a, 
an area of, of nothing but rental towers on a building no higher than the stuff around it, and it took 11 years to get through the process. Not 11 years to build, just to get approvals. Um, and uh, and that, I'm not just throwing on a, a bad example. It would be, if I have probably, say, 15, 16 projects going through Vancouver today, I could tell that story on every one of them. Um, so, the, so I would say in Vancouver, you do have a supply issue. The supply is constrained. And in, in, a, in a really perverted sort of way, it's actually good for me, right? Right. <laughs> And because I, you've you got know, units there, that thank sell. you. Yeah. You know, uh, it's frustrating, but it's 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 making me nothing but money. Um, <laughs> don't tell anyone. Uh, so then you get to then you get to Van, uh, to Toronto, and it's a very different different situation. And you know, um, the reality is, that, um, it is difficult with all that demand there today. Mm -hmm. It's much more difficult to get a construction loan today than it was two years ago. Construction loan. Yeah, to get to get financing, the banks are concerned. They read the same papers that these prices are going up. There's too much too much supply coming on. We're going to be overbuilding, and so uh, it's it, it is difficult to get trades. It's difficult. It's construction prices are rising um, at probably three times what the inflation rate is, um, and so there is constraints within the system. And you think about it, it's it's uh, if you had the Olympics here suddenly the price of concrete would go up, right? right. The supply of labor would go up. In, in Toronto, you're having a hard time adapting to the fact that a lot of people are moving here. And that's a pretty natural thing to be happening. The system isn't perfectly fluid. There is rigidities in the system, and you're feeling the negative uh, uh, externalities that come from uh, uh, that rate of growth. And, you know, sorry. It's just the way it is. Uh, <laughs> it, and it's going to take a little while for the market to, uh, to adapt. I think the, the, one of the more interesting questions, and I think that what Jennifer was touching on is the, you know, the conversations around foreign purchasers and taxes and that kind of thing. What it's, what it's doing is it's avoiding the, the real issues, and it's kind of a populist uh, uh, conversation. And the real issues are, you know, what more can we be doing to make housing more affordable for elements of society that need help? Um, and what can, we doing, what can we be doing to make um, housing more sustainable in a really much more um, broader sense, uh, sustainable from a transportation, from an energy use, from a, a affordability, from a livability, and, and, and more, all those holistic uh, ideas that we should really be talking about on, ho and on housing. And it, we're, we're not talking about them because we're talking about stupid things. So, so to the extent that, the, and then, so earlier in this conversation, a part of the uh, solution, so to speak, to, to housing affordability, if I could oversimplify, as people do, was that uh, why any people in their early 20s should suck it up and get used to the fact that we've all been done this, right? Uh, especially reporters, uh, uh, who are sometimes welcome here and sometimes not. Um, but, uh, but, 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 and more seriously though, that, that maybe, uh, like New York or Paris, uh, part of emerging as a city that is growing at the rate that we're growing, that is becoming as big as we are becoming, is people adjusting their expectations and thinking that the good life might involve renting uh, mm -hmm. for their lifetime, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that that would be a good way to raise their family. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that, that your uh, buildings proposed at the Honest mm -hmm. Ed site are uh, rental units. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something we've seen. We saw almost none of that for like 25 years in this city, and now mm -hmm. we're finally starting to see rental units come back. How big a part is, is purpose-built rental uh, to, the, to the solution in, in, to, the, to the extent that then people looking to raise a family or looking for a place to live uh, who want a place to rent? Like right now, I have three children, and it, I, I own a house. Uh, by some weird miracle of the market, uh, I got in at a one, the only house in the city I could ever afford. Uh, but, but, uh, but we occasionally look around mm -hmm. uh, to see, and it, to find a place, like, it's virtually impossible to find a place where you, where you could comfortably rent uh, with three children. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, and when you can find a place, it's radically expensive. And so how, how big a, and what, 
I guess how big a part should rental be of the solution? And what can we do, generally, the city or, or us as people, mm -hmm. to encourage that to happen? Mm -hmm. So I would say rental is an enormous part of our future. And the good news is that we have the right uh, economic conditions and the confidence in the city uh, such that we have re purpose-built rental buildings coming forward for the very first time, a significant number of them. Ian can talk about why it makes sense to do rental at this point uh, on his project. To go back to the expectation piece a minute, you know, I have two kids uh, who love this city and want to live in the city, and I think I'm doing a pretty good job right now of socializing them. They have no expectation of buying, a, buying <laughs> like, you know, we talk about what's it like raising your family in a condo, which would be a big shift from how they were raised. But I think if you asked my 16-year-old right now, she would just assume she's raising her kid in a condo if she's staying in Toronto, uh, because she sees the writing on the wall, and that's actually not a scary thing to her. It's linked into a big piece of work we're doing right now called Growing Up Vertical. And Growing Up Vertical is all about raising families in vertical communities, and we've been working with interior designers, with developers, looking at really three scales. How you design a unit, how you design a building, and how you design a neighborhood that is vertical, that is for families. And we're doing that, we're, you know, I think we're about 10 years too late in doing it, but we're doing it now and we're getting it done. We're doing it because in the context of our analysis of the growth in the downtown and how we manage growth in the downtown, we discovered something that shocked us all, which is we have a baby boom happening right in the core of the city. And in speaking with young people, with young families in the downtown, uh, contrary to the popular idea that they're only staying there because they can't afford to go anywhere else, and as soon as they can afford to, they're going to move out to the suburbs, these young families have saying to, are saying to us, this is our first choice. We want to be able to walk to work. We want to be able to raise our family in an urban environment. We think this is a great quality of life. We've got a nice small environmental footprint, and in fact, we don't own a car. And that, that is something that has already has a tremendous amount of traction in the city. So for some of us in the room, that may be a radical idea, but it's already happening in our city. It's not a radical idea in our city. So, and, and, and maybe the, and actually, for generations, of course, well, there are a thousand concrete slab towers along the Don Valley and in the inner suburbs of the Toronto, um, and people have been raising families in those for, for 40 years in this exactly. city. Um, but there has, I think, for a long time been a perception that maybe the people who lived in concrete slab towers as families would like to live in a house. Um, how are we, and we, we have to wrap up so we can get to the audience's questions, but I did want to know, you're a developer who's building purpose-built rental mm -hmm. apartments. Mm -hmm. um, and and in a fairly innovative way, I think. But, but from your perspective, why has that been so rare? Uh, why do you want to do it? And, and how, you know, how, how can we make that spread? How mm -hmm. can we get other people doing that too? Mm -hmm. we've, we've got about 8,000 units of, of rental going up right now. Um, and you know, the number one reason it works is interest rates. You know, we're at historically low interest rates. Um, and this is our time. Um, so that's number one. Number two is um, government policy. Um, there are, every city is slightly different. In Vancouver, uh, there's quite a few incentives to build purpose-built rental. I think, uh, I think that's something that Jennifer would probably agree with me, that Toronto could be doing better, is, is by right now we have these low interest rates. We should be pushing more and more rental. Um, um, because, you know, someday interest rates are going to go back to 10% and suddenly rental's not going to work anymore. Mm -hmm. And we're all going to sit back and we're going to go, gosh, I wish we had to build 50,000 more units of it. And uh, so, um, uh, and then, and then it's, it's supply and demand. I mean, the vacancy rate in, in, in uh, Toronto for uh, purpose-built rental apartments is about 1% to 1.5%. Um, so that means it, uh, it needs supplying. And so it, the demand is there, interest rates are low, government policy, um, and, and that's why uh, suddenly you're seeing some purpose-built rental, but you're not seeing enough. And we need, I, I, I agree with Jennifer, we need more rental as a percentage of the overall housing continuum. It, it's part of it is about building a flexible economy. You think about the way that, that, that families grow up today versus, you know, in, in my parents' generation. You took a job, you worked there for 38 years, you got freedom 65, and you got a pension, 
And uh, today, that's not how it is. You're, you're going through five or six careers. And so that flexibility that you need in an economy, um, that how, uh, rental housing, I think, plays a, a, a really uh, important role in that flexibility. Uh, you go in, in Seattle, where we're very active, for example, you work, the average person at Amazon works there for three and a half years. You think about that, that's so different than the, than the way we're used to our society developing. So owning a home, when you think you're going to move from there to, to San Antonio. Just your cost of selling right? it Just your cost is going to be, yeah. 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 Okay, uh, before we get to audience questions, I have a, a really quick question because I, I believe in some ways you've already answered it. But if you're talking about housing prices in Toronto or anywhere in Canada, um, I think one question that a lot of people have is because there's a McLean's Magazine cover that comes out about once every two months or so that's like, the crash is coming and we're all going to uh, be poor and destitute. Uh, the, this bubble is about to burst. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I think I first read that in 1996. <laughs> They'd be saying it every year since. Every, every year. year. <laughs> it's, uh, um, and not just McLean's, uh, but, but everybody else. You hear this quite a lot. Um, but, so I'll just ask. Uh, like, do you expect that there's a bubble going on in Toronto that's going to burst and solve the affordability crisis to the extent it creates the other crisis, but it would certainly bring prices down? Is that, is that, is that coming in you your view? You can't ask a developer that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer. Uh, there's no bubble. There's no bubble. Uh, there's a bubble when there's a mismatch between what you're building and people occupying those units. You've got investors who are not living in those units. We don't have that problem. Our units are occupied. We don't have dark buildings. The lights are on. People are living in the, in, in the, in the units. There also is a bubble when there's a mismatch between what people can afford and right. what they're paying for housing. And despite the fact that affordability is challenging, and we've already established that you know, in a, in a market-driven economy, that's always, that there's always going to be an element of that. One of the reasons why prices are going up so much is because the economy is so strong and there are good jobs in this city and good salaries in this city. And as a result, people can afford to pay a lot for housing. And what that means is it's simply bumping out people the tier below who are making less money. But people buying those $4 million homes can afford to buy them. So one of the challenges we, so that isn't a bubble, it's a shortage of supply driven by very high demand. Fair enough. Okay, and then? I'm gonna take one crack at it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're, uh, one of the things that we're very fortunate in Canada is, is the banking system uh, is much more disciplined um, than other parts of the world, and that's what saved us in 08. And, and uh, you know, when the rest of the world was going off the cliff, um, our, our banking system held solid. And I can tell you that it is much more difficult today to get a construction loan to build a 40-story apartment building than it was two years, three years, four years ago. And that's the banking doing what it should do, which is, hold on here, maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, let's not let that happen. And so it's, the market is doing what it should do, and so um, I feel that there is no bubble. Okay, and but I, I would say that I think it's something we probably should look a lot closer at.